All right, let's go ahead and get started. Hi, welcome. Um, thank you for being here. Thanks for caring about watersheds and bioregions and beans and for being in community together at the Montana Book Festival. Uh, my name is Maya Joel Zeller. I'm a contributor to the anthology Cascadia Field Guide, Art, Ecology, and Poetry. I'm filling in for Derek Sheffield, C. Marie Furman, and Liz Bradfield the editors who couldn't be here. <laughs> so I'm with Alexandra Teague, who's on the end here, and we'll be running the slideshow. So thank you for allowing us to step in in lieu of these editors. And I also want to thank the editors, the festival, and Mountaineers Books for making this really beautiful anthology, as well as the artists who illustrated the beans. So I'm going to actually just read a brief section from the introduction of the anthology. I'm assuming that most people in the room kind of have a sense of what's happening but I'll go ahead and give you just a few paragraphs of introduction. This is from the editors. Welcome to Cascadia. Welcome to rugged mountains, lush temperate rainforest, ice fields, rolling plains, high desert, fertile lowlands, and hundreds of miles of shoreline, highway, and trail that span international boundaries and homelands. Welcome to the home of Madrona, gooey duck, giant Palouse earthworm, and Cassia crossbill. Welcome to a distinctive place beloved by current residents, many ancestors, and visitors. And welcome to a new way of seeing, where poetry, art, and ecology might work together to envision not just a place, but a rich engagement with place. Upon first hearing the word Cascadia, some might focus on the Cascade Range, but its roots actually lie in the waters of our region. Cascadia is defined, according to the Sightline Institute, by the watersheds of rivers that flow into the Pacific Ocean through North America's temperate rainforest zone. That's a big zone. Cascadia stretches from Alaska's Prince William Sound in the north to Northern California's Eel River in the south, from the Pacific Coast to the Continental Divide. Alaska's Panhandle, handle, excuse me, British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Northern California, and even the edges of Montana and Wyoming are held in Cascadia. The way this event will work is each of us are contributors or artists to the anthology in some way. We will read from our work. The slide will present the bean. I will then say, welcome Laura Reed, the next person. She will then read her poem and pass it down. And so each of us will introduce the next person and you will hear a smattering of beans. In the middle, we have an artist, Claire, and Claire's going to talk about her process. And then we'll continue on. And at the end of that, we will open up for audience questions. So I'm going to start and transition from moderator to writer. Uh, so my being in this book is skunk cabbage. If you'd like to follow along, it's on page 62. I'm not going to read the bean story, but I do want to talk a little bit about my own earliest memory of skunk cabbage. I grew up in southwest Washington and northwest Oregon, and my very first memory of skunk cabbage, my parents had moved into um, a billiards hall that they were trying to run as a family fun center. And we also lived in our van. And there was a mattress store next door. And I used to, with my sister, sneak into the mattress store at night and sleep on the mattresses. And that was during the night. And then during the day, I used to play in the ravines and the swamps behind the family fun center because we kind of lived there. And in the swamps were these bright, bright, bright yellow skunk cabbages. And I remember thinking there was this distinctive um, interplay, kind of like a, you know, an ecosystem between those skunk cabbage leaves and the mattresses I was sleeping on, kind of stealing into. <laughs> and I would make shoes out of the skunk cabbages and strap them to my feet. So I have kind of a playful uh, relationship with skunk cabbage. And uh, this poem is informed by the childhood in which nothing was permanent, so the plants became my intimates, intimates and my friends. This is skunk cabbage. Your spiked flower hardly knows its own allure, like lemon cookie, like hooded clitoris. Shake you and you let go dew. Your name means dew in Hebrew, my mother tells me at 13. I've spent the day staring at skunk cabbage, rubbing the stamen glow between fingers, learning its curve and awe, the pulpy bumped berries fleshing its core. 
If I were water, I'd catch in the cup of you, swamp lantern. I'd reside in the light, the rosette of your hips. Thanks. So next we have Laura Reed with the pocket gopher. Thank you, Maya. And I'm really happy to be part of this. I actually was not an outdoors child. I still rarely go outdoors. Um, I <laughs> So I'm not like a logical person to be invited to be in this book, but I got in anyway. And actually, my... Um, <laughs> I snuck in there. My um, my relationship to my being is weird. Um, so as an indoors person, I was watching some TV in the 1980s, and there was a television commercial that was for a dog treat called Snossages. I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with this, but in this, the dog pokes his head around the corner and keeps going, Snossages, like that. <laughs> and I find this very charming, and I've been doing this to my children all their lives. So I really like things that kind of are like, I described this to Maya yesterday, the right amount of startle. And I am very interested in, in gophers for that reason. <laughs> so so when, they, when I was given, a, there were only a few choices left when they were like, we should ask an indoorsy person, I guess. And so, um, and so there was my friend, the northern pocket gopher. And so that's my relationship to it. But Snossages doesn't make itself into the poem. So that's why I had to do it first. Okay, also the northern pocket gopher. There are some things in this book that I did not know about the northern pocket gopher when I wrote this poem, and he is quite a little hero. So I think you should definitely read about him on page 290 and 291. Okay, northern pocket gopher. I believe in the resurrection of the body because every Sunday I sat patiently in my pew and watched a priest hold up a small circle of unleavened bread and proclaim, this is my body, I give it up for you. He did not mean his own body, of course, which was hidden beneath so much purple or gold, bolts of fabric. I love the word bolt with fabric, don't you? I love it when the women at Joanne take the bolt, you hand them and unfold it and unfold it until you tell them to stop. I don't want them to stop unfolding, to get out their large scissors. I want the fabric to be continuous, the way I want the body. For example, I only start to believe someone is dead if they've been dead for years, and mostly not even then. This is what I like about you, Northern Pocket Gopher. I have never actually seen you in person, but that doesn't mean that I won't. I like pockets in general. They're a novelty for women, you know, who are always exclaiming about a dress. It has pockets, because for centuries, no one believed we might want to carry something. I can tell you we do. I thought the pocket was the place in the dirt you poked through or a pocket in time where your life and mine could finally intersect. But in fact, the pockets are your cheeks that you stuff with food like a man who doesn't know where his next meal is coming from. Just try telling you you can't take it with you. Whenever my mother told a story about my father, I tried to be quiet enough that she wouldn't get distracted, but not so quiet that she would notice her spell. One I especially liked was the dinner party. Someone brought a pineapple. They were walking up the steps of the porch when my dad opened the door and exclaimed, thank you, Jane never lets me have pineapple. It's like a photograph people sigh when they see and say, well, that really captures him. Thank you. Oh, I'm up, okay. <laughs> okay. Our next reader is Corey Williamson, and Corey's being is the greater sage grouse. Thank you, Laura. That was really fantastic. <laughs> um, I am just really honored to be in this book, which is uh, just kind of a, a stunning collection, and to be on this panel with this group of, of really great folks. Um, and likewise, as with Laura, I got the list of beings that needed to needed poems written about them. Um, and the wonderful Elizabeth Bradfield sent me that list, and I looked through it, and I remember thinking, oh my gosh, nobody has picked the greater sage grouse um, and feeling both excited and intimidated to get to write about that really incredible species. Um, and in Montana, we have a lot of different grouse that you may know. Um, if you've ever been walking in the woods and heard that drumming that kind of sounds like the forest is having a panic attack, um, that's the ruffed grouse, we have the spruce grouse, we have blue grouse, uh, but the, the greater 
um, sage grouse is really a resident of that shrub step ecosystem. So those um, prairies and, and sagebrush that are part of Cascadia and also part of where I live now in central Montana. Um, and because of where I live and also the, the work that I do in conservation, I've been very lucky in the last couple springs to go out and witness the dance of the sage grouse, um, which is a really astonishing thing. Um, the males have these sort of huge yellow air sacs on their chests that they inflate and it makes this kind of like sound like ice breaking up like this like it's it's nuts. And they do this and they have this like elaborate sort of feather sort of spiked feather fan and they just like strut around and like bump each other and like inflate their chests at each other. And the females just kind of watch and like generally look unimpressed. Um, but it is, it's just a phenomenon. And both because of the awesomeness of that site and because sage grouse are declining all across the West, I really encourage you to, to put it on your bucket list if you can. And when I've been out to, to see this dance, I've often thought of um, a poem by Mary Oliver, and I know Mary Oliver's having kind of a pop culture uh, reconnaissance or renaissance right now, so you know, no judgment either way, but she wrote some beautiful poems. Um, and she has a poem called Lead, which is kind of a really sort of subtle exposure of the wreckage and destruction of lead ammunition and lead fishing lures um, that have just really decimated bird populations. And she's writing about the song of the loon. And she says, um, if you have heard it, you know it is a sacred thing. And if you have never heard it, you had better hurry to where they still sing. And believe me, tell no one just where that is. And I agree with some of that, but also I have to say, if you are down to drive out to the prairie and get up at four in the morning and stand in the dark waiting for the sun to come up on a spring day, to see sage grouse through your binoculars, I will share my onyx waypoints with you. So, um, so this poem is really meant to be kind of a, a conversation about um, the fate of this bird uh, and recognizing that there are many forces and interests that threaten it um, and thinking about, thinking about that and thinking about what we might learn from an animal that kind of returns with this incredible fidelity every year to the same place to, to dance and find a mate and, and lay its eggs. So this poem is called Sage Grouse, A Prayer. Let us agree at least on this. It is not above a bird to hold a sacred map in the mind. It is not below a bird to nest tucked to earth, sealinged by fragrant sage whose double roots have dual plans a layer of veined lace at the surface that drinks sudden rain, and the deep taproot that holds and seeks, holds and gathers. Suede leaf eaters, the female gray and essential as grass, the male with his throne of feathered spines, drums in the great sagging feathered breast. They return year after year to the lek to dance return to the shadow of the oil derrick and its plunging black everlapping tongue, return to land slicked over by asphalt or raised up and rowed by the plow, shorn clean by tooth and hoofs slow grind. Let me keep the sage hen lodged lodestone like in my brain, trying to see it this way, that the body offers itself to song on land unparsable from the dance, life beginning as thunder in the throat. Uh, and I will pass it on now to the fabulous artist Claire Emery, who I just got to meet and sit next to. How exciting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're funny. Um, I, uh, well, I am so grateful to be here. Um, I, When I was asked to uh, be a part of this book. I knew, but let me know if I'm not doing this right because I don't know about microphones. Um, <laughs> when I was asked to be a part of this book, uh, when Liz called me, Liz Bradfield, I, I mean, I immediately said yes because for me, it's my life's work for my entire um, adult life and through much of my unconscious childhood, you know, not being aware of what I was doing is. Really, I've been trying to find my way into relationship with um, the living 
landscape community. Landscape not as something beautiful to look at through a window um, or something to see as we drive by in a car, but something that is alive and it's full of neighbors. Um, so this quest to, to uh, befriend and discover and, um, and um, kind of try to cultivate some sort of friendship with these other than human beings um, really has been my work. So when Liz called, I was like, yes, I'm there. Um, okay, so um, uh, this image is the, the one that's at the beginning of a section I, I made woodcuts for, and that's called the Montaigne section. That's uh, where we live here. And I did a lot of thinking. It took me a winter of thinking to figure out how to fit 11 species in one image, which was my job. <laughs> um, and how, so, so I realized water, of course, was at the center of it, because here in the arid, here where we are here in the arid west, we need water, and it is the, the, a very clear source of life. So I worked the image around that. But um, first, let me take you, oh, what do we do? Do I point to you? Okay, so this is a picture of me in my studio. <laughs> and actually, it's, it's I, I, I think of the blocks that I carve as, for me, they're kind of like a form of visual poetry. And just like good poems, good poems shouldn't just sit dormant in a book, un, unsung, unspoken. I feel like woodcuts, they shouldn't just sit in a box. So I always leave my blocks on the wall and I kind of commune with them and dialogue with them while I'm indoors. But the truth is my real studio is outdoors. It's where I ramble. And I'm always trying to um, find and meet new, new friends in the landscape um, throughout all the seasons and the weathers. So um, I work with my hands, um, but, but in the field, my work begins with my sketchbook. And here's, here's one of them I'm carrying around. Um, as long as it's hard backed and I've got some kind of ballpoint pen, I'm good to go. And I'll ramble around, write, draw, and try to get to know whatever my subject is. Um, this morning I was in a rowboat trying to check out a beaver lodge. It was really fun. And my pants are still wet from it. <laughs> um, so I, I, um, I work with my hands. And what I'm doing is just like, like poets and writers take words to create a story or a, you know, an experience. Um, that that we can find ourselves in and enter into, I I use um, a vocabulary of marks, and so really all of my pieces are um, just they're not just a species or a place, but they're sort of like, they're vocabulary marks that come together to create something that hopefully is you know is quite different from a photograph. There's sort of the energy of the hand in there, the energy of the land, whatever I can let in there, I, I try to let it in. Um, this is one of my blocks that I carved. Um, it's actually made of um, a tree called uh, Shina. It's Japanese. It's, I wish it were right here from the local woods, but this is a great wood to carve. Um, and I will, I'll pass this around. I want you to feel it. It's made, it's a basswood laminate. Um, Shina is from the basswood family. It's hard enough to hold um, really pretty exquisite detail, but it's soft enough to not, um, to not destroy my body when I work with it, as long as my tools are sharp. If you could pass that. Um, so I, I um, oh, let's see if this works. I've never done this before. Do you have to press play or does it work? Oh, no, I guess it doesn't. Oh, wait, go back for a second. Let's just see. I've. OK, we don't get to see it. Too bad. <laughs> but um, what, what I was hoping that could show you, I've never put a video on a PowerPoint. Um, is just a close-up of how my hands work, how I work with the wood, how, um, how I kind of open it up. And I, I think of it as drawing with light, because I start with a dark surface instead of a white page, and I actually am removing um, and lighting up what I want to show. So here, um, you can imagine that work with the tool. It's, I use V and U-shaped gouges. Let's go to the next one. And then this is um, the print that ended up going into the book. Um, I've never put a fish under the water um, before. So this was really an interesting quest. Oh, and I want to read you a little piece. Oh, and I, I can't because you have the, can you see in the notes right there below this piece? Do you see the little, there's a little excerpt from Andrew Gottlieb's poem. Would you re read that please? This is, this is so I, I worked directly from the writing, from the poetry to try to come up with these images. If you could read that, thanks. The 
weight of the descending flow, cold, heavy, dedicated to places downstream, confronts you while you stare alone at the giant cutthroat, mythic in the deepest pools, snippet from the Walking Gods poem by Godly. Okay, thank you. We're collaborating up here. <laughs> okay, next one. So I, um, this is midway working on the bear grass image. Um, and I, for the heck of it, I thought, well, I'm going to pop a bear into the bear grass one. Um, bear grass is so lovely. And I could, I thought, how could I ever hope to convey it? So I just decided, I'm just going to try. You know, we'll see what happens. So you can see how I'm, sometimes I draw with white on my darkened block. Um, you can see the pencil marks. Um, that kind of helps me figure out where to go. The initial drawing is nothing like the detail of what comes out from the tools, because the tools are what create the image, that vocabulary of marks that only the tools can create, not a pen or a pencil. So poof, there is the bear grass and the grizzly cub. Here we have the hoary marmot. This went along with um, Derek Sheffield's poem. And I think there's an excerpt. Do you see that at the bottom? OK. So I've, oh, just one second. So what I try to do is I haven't encountered, actually, I've probably encountered most of these beings in my rambles through the woods. But this one um, is one of those two up high, the, um, the hoary marmot. My quest is to con sort of combine my firsthand experience with the, the subject with um, reference material resources and then create an image out of all of that together. Okay, let's hear from Derek, who's... Or maybe I need... Oh, you? Okay, yes. Is this working? Now? Yes, okay. This is from How We Look by Derek Sheffield. Fur fat and stock still in the trail, they appear to be looking into a mythic sky. And there's so much more, and there's so much more to that poem if you haven't read it. You gotta read it because that is only a snippet. Um, okay, let's go to the next one. Um, I have to say this one I'm, I think, the least pleased with. But the quest here was to show the mighty and minuscule ice worm. Um, Robert, Robert Service wrote about it. And these are, they're just, they're just exist by the millions in like a square foot of, of a mountain, high, high mountain snow. So they're kind of ice worms in the front. And um, goodbye, ice worms. OK. <laughs> <laughs> so I got um, I got very focused on detail in this piece. This is the mountain goat, and here we have a larch. Um, so interesting. Every piece I make after I see it, I'm like, oh, that's how you turned out. And then I have so many ideas for maybe uh, you know how I could do it differently, just like life. This. Um, those are gray jays, and they look kind of awfully sweet to be gray jays, <laughs> but it's because they're in love. And they, um, they came from, uh, if you read the poem that relates to this being the gray jays, I think you'll know um, what I'm talking about. Um, but I had an amazing experience when I was hiking down one morning from um, snow bowl in the middle of summer it was super misty and I heard a cacophony like you just wouldn't believe like I was like what is that well it turns out as we came through the mist we saw about 30 or 40 um, gray jays all in a tree together just going berserk it was amazing I've never sort of felt that energy before from the gray jay who's usually solitary when I see a gray jay so um, so that inspired me when I worked on this piece as well as the poem and I think we're almost towards the end here. This is a little subalpin sub fur. Um, yeah. So there's a little, that's what's left over when I work. <laughs> Just the little carvings that come out of the uh, wood. If anyone wants to look at um, any of the blocks more closely afterwards, feel free to come up and I will show them to you. And um, the next person we hear from is Keisha Kuypers. Did I do it? Whoa. Uh, thank you, Claire. That was so incredible. Um, I, I want to uh, 
I want to talk about engagement a little bit with with these beings and um, it's uh, it was so great to hear you talk about the way that you engage with these beings, the way you interact, the way you're present in the world, and then the way that engagement enters the work that you make. Um, I think a lot about uh, what goes into a poem and whether or not that thing in the poem is just a prop or if it's really something that's that's being engaged with in the poem. And I think about this a lot in the way I live in the world as well. Um, I sort of think that if you're really going to be an American, you have to live in a lot of different places in America. Uh, I think that if you're really going to call yourself an omnivore, you have to have some experience killing what you eat. Um, and, uh, and then I think about poems like hunting. You know, you compare that going, you know, waking up in the dark, uh, hiking up a mountain with a headlamp on before dawn. Um, it's, you know, waiting for everything around you to, to wake up and start moving, or at least it's, you know, maybe it's already awake and moving, but you can't see it yet. So waiting for there to be enough light for you to see it. Um, a lot of looking, a lot of waiting, a lot of listening, and then uh, a very precise moment. And then everything that happens after after that moment as well, right? Um, a hunt is not pulling a trigger or, you know, loosing the arrow. There's there's so much before and there's so much after that. And all of that has to be or should be in the best version of hunting, uh, total engagement with place and with the beings around you. Um, and I think the same thing about poems, right? You don't just put animals in poems to, um, you know, make it sexy or call yourself a nature poet or, um, <laughs> you know, to, to sort of demonstrate that you know what a mountain goat is, you put them in the poem because you are engaging with that being and you're opening up a conversation between yourself and the things of the world within that poem. Um, so I'm lucky because my father is somebody who I call a later in life hunter. He is 73 and uh, last week he... Um, shot a mountain goat at 165 yards up in the crazies uh, and he's only been hunting for about 10 years and um, getting to be a part of his journey as a hunter and um, and the experiences that he has had growing into that um, person that he is now in the natural world has has allowed me to engage with the natural world in another way as well. Um, so he usually goes to very remote places. He's often, often uses a bow, um, uh, a bow and arrow, um, and uh, rather than a rifle, uh, he mountain bikes, hikes, um, finds himself at, at the edge of what so many of us think of as the knowable world, and that's where he hunts from. And every now and then, he gets a little bit of cell phone service. Um, the only other thing you need to know about this poem is that there is also a butterfly in it. It's an Anarsha Amathea Amathea. The elk my father shot is an imagined butterfly of flesh. Thin cannon bones pinning back its winged hide like a boxed inertia amethia amethia, all white speckled gristle and silver tendon seam. When he calls me from the mountaintop and leaves his breathless message, afraid at last of what he's done, telling of the bow, the arrow, his tin pan, trembling heart and shaking arm, quiet so as not to scare away the grazing ghost he's made, as if this yearly taking of a life were a talisman carried in his pocket beside the knife, a charm against entropy, his own brittle bones. All right, and now we have Sean Hill with the white-headed woodpecker. Oh, um, I, I, I'm just honored to be a part of this anthology, this project. Um, it's been great hearing everyone 
uh, read and share their work. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Corey, Laura, Maya, Keisha. Thank you all. Um, so, like others have mentioned, um, Elizabeth Bradfield reached out to me. Um, I think there might have been a list or something at some point. We were just talking. I was maybe going to write a poem about the Junko or um, gooey duck, which I harvested once, um, dug up a gooey duck with Liz, actually, and her mom. It was really kind of awesome. Um, I had all these ideas. And then she like reached out again. She's like, where's that poem, the thing you were going to do? And I was like, ah, working on it, maybe something, it'll come. Um, and then finally, she reached out again. She's like, what about the white-headed woodpecker? Can you write a poem for me? Um, I like birds. I, I, I like checking out birds, hanging out around birds. And um, I got a couple of poems about birds. They show up in my poems. I was like, I don't know, Liz, maybe. Like, I don't remember seeing one. Let me, look, let me just look at it. And so I pulled the, the birding guide off the shelf and looked. And I was like, oh. I think we could have possibly overlapped in Roslyn, Washington. This one afternoon, like 10 years ago. And so I was like, let me, let me try this. Roslyn, Washington um, is um, a little bit of a detour off of, of um, 90. And um, it's a place that um, I think I first sort of learned about, thought about, um, because of Northern Exposure, um, which I loved when I was, when I was a, a college kid. Um, and um, yeah, Northern Exposure. And then being uh, who I am, um, a black person out in uh, the West, traveling around the West and trying to learn about the West, I, I found out that um, a large number of black folk um, migrated from the South to Roslyn, Washington in the late 19th century. Um, and so that's why I was in Roslyn like that 10 years ago. Um, just because I was like, what, what's left of them having been there? Um, and so finding out that you know black folk were there, I was there, and the white-headed woodpecker would be there um, I, I sat to write this poem. The White-Headed Woodpecker. Quiet, given to prying more than pecking, an odd member of the family lives only in the high pine forests of western mountains like the Cascades, where it's spent and where I spent an afternoon almost a decade ago in Roslyn, Washington, looking for what I could find of black people who'd migrated from the South almost a century and a quarter prior. The white-headed woodpecker doesn't migrate and so is found in its home range year-round when it can be found. Roslyn founded as a coal mining town, drew miners from all over Europe, as far away as Croatia, across the ocean with opportunities. With their hammering and drilling to extract a living, woodpeckers could be considered arboreal miners. A habitat, a home range, is where one can feed and house oneself meet the requirements of life, and propagate. In 1888, those miners from, all, from many lands, all in Rosalind, came together to go on strike against the mine management. And so, from southern states, a few hundred black miners were recruited with the promise of opportunities in Rosalind many with their families in tow to break the strike. They faced resentment and armed resistance, left in the dark until their arrival, unwitting scabs, 
that healing that happens after lacerations or abrasions. Things settle down as they do sometimes. And eventually, blacks and whites entered a union as equals. Black, save for a white face and crown and a sliver of white on its wings that flares to a crescent when they spread for flight, the white-headed woodpecker is a study in stark contrast. Males have a patch of red feathers on the back of their crowns, and I can't help but see blood. And next up, we have Tammy Holland. It's great to see you all here, and it's really great to be with all of these talented people. Um, and I love this book. Um, my poem is old. Can you hear me? Can people hear? Okay. 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 I'll, I'll straighten that out then. Okay. So uh, it's great to be here. It's great to see you. Um, and uh, my poem is, is um, I did not write it for the book. Um, they took it from my first book. Uh, so it's old. It's, you know, 20-some-odd um, years old at least. And I grew up on the um, Montana prairie. And, um, you know, that was just the world I knew. And every time I tried to write about it, it uh, it sort of fell flat. It got cliched. I wasn't sure how to go about it. So one day I was following a deer trail um, in, near the Marias River, and um, I just started naming things. And so I created this list poem. Um, so um, in the title is a gold eye, which is a fish. Um, and uh, I think a lot of the other things in there are probably reasonably familiar. Gold Eye Vole. I say sweep of prairie or curve of sandstone, but it doesn't come close to this language of dry wind and deer prints, blue racer and sage, its punctuation, white quartz and bone. I learned mounds of mayflowers, needle grass on ankles, the occasional sweet pea, before I knew words like perspective or travesty or the permanence of loss. My tongue spoke obsidian, red agate, arrowhead. I stepped through teepee rings, leaped buffalo grass and puffball to petrified clam, jawbone of fox, flint, Blue lichen, gay feather, gold eye, vole. Speak to me, my prairie darling. Sing me that song you know. I want to also share, we, this is one of our options. We could share another poem. And it happens that Ursula Le Guin is also in this chapter. And I would really love to read her poem to you. It's called Lesser Senses. Thinking of beauty as sight, we keep forgetting the warmth of the fire in the brightness of firelight, in the graceful ripples and grace of water to thirst. Soft as air, the touch of fur on the touching hand is as beautiful, surely, as the curve of the cat's sleep. No keener beauty than a dry branch of sagebrush, the harsh, poignant scent, bringing the silent desert distances back to the heart. And now Alexandra Teague. It's such an honor, as everybody's been saying, to be a part of this anthology and to get to help with this panel today. And I Although I spend all of the time I possibly can backpacking, camping, and hiking is my passion, and I've done that a lot in the West, I'm not a poet who usually writes about my experiences in the wilderness. That's kind of the space where I go to commune without 
thinking about language in the same way. And so it's a little bit unusual for me to write about the natural world, um, unlike Sean, who I've known for years, who's a wonderful birder. I only got into birding a little bit during the pandemic, as many people did as they got trapped at their houses and started finally wondering, what is that thing outside, um, other than bird. Um, so I did a little bit of birding during that period and um, didn't do very much hiking and camping during that time uh, because I was feeling kind of initially, you know, immobilized to even, you know, leave my immediate environment. Uh, but the one trip that my husband and I did in 2020 was to go to a place called Grandmother Mountain in Idaho. And um, we got out there and in the morning we saw these absolutely amazing looking black and white birds flying over us that were just awe-inspiring. So we had brought our birding guide and we figured out what they were and that they were Clark's Nutcrackers and it was just this really uh, magical experience. So as soon as I saw the Clark's Nutcracker on the list that Liz Bradfield sent me, I was like, okay, this being I do have a connection with that I want to try to put into language. And um, Claire did this amazing woodcut in response. So. So this is called First Seeing Clark's Nutcrackers, June 2020. We'd driven to a mountain named Grandmother to be alone in fields of bear grass with our fears. We'd brought binoculars to bring the world close without touching it. We were just starting to suspect for years we'd been like children playing with binoculars the wrong way round, tunneling everything to one distant spot called the future playing pin the treasure on every map we had to survive here. Between Douglas firs, nutcrackers cracked and rode the updrafts, their tails fanning like flying pianos with too few black keys. Their beaks jet trowels, the original jaws of life, could pry open the tightest cones of white bark pines. In one summer, we read, one bird could stash 80,000 seeds in mounds of two or three, then precisely remember months later those tens of thousands of caches under snowdrift and deadfall. The land shedding seasons and details, adding saplings and squirrels and heather, like those word problems we never thought we'd really need. We were starting to suspect knowledge was never a single compact apple. We were starting to wish we hadn't just copied from the answer key. How to stay alive in the woods said, there is just one method to keep from getting lost, and that is to stay found. Like most tautologies, the distance between a thing and itself only grew farther as we tried to speak of it. Stocked grocery store, family at holidays, faces with two whole halves, people not dying or fewer. What we thought were trees swept by fire on the ridge, their trunks blanched ashy, were white bark pines killed by beetles and blister rust, a ghost forest. Only the caches the nutcrackers fail to find may grow more trees. Imagine mapping more than your own survival, knowing months before how to pry and fly and hide one seed, then another seed. So to close out this wonderful panel, before we open it up to questions from all of you, I just wanted to share some fantastic things, including that the anthology has been adopted as a text throughout this region and has been selected for one college, one book common read programs. And it also, as some of you may know, spent 22 weeks on the Pacific Northwest Bookseller Association bestseller list, which is just a really beautiful testament to how many people care about this region and learning more from it. As you've heard, all of us learned so much in the process of being asked to engage in these ways and then reading one another's work and seeing one another's art and, and thinking about all of the different ways that these beings coexist in this vast and very varied region. Um, so we'd love to open it up now. We've got a good amount of time, I think, for questions. So if people have things they'd like to ask, we have another microphone here, and I think we could um, 
have that delivered to you. If you just raise your hand, a microphone will come to you, and then we can pass the microphone down the row and answer. Who, so who envisioned this project? What was step one? I think it was a joint conversation between Derek Sheffield and Elizabeth Bradfield, who then brought in C. Marie Furman as an editor as well. I don't, do you know the details on that, Maya? I can run this down to you. But I think that Liz is a poet and also naturalist. Derek is a poet and lives in this region. Liz was raised in this region. Do you know? OK. Do you know more than that? I don't know a lot more than that, but I will say that I've heard the editors speak about the process and they they talk about the very intensive conversations that they had that really were about community of ideas and their different viewpoints and how they should approach the anthology. And they really did collaborate. It was a it was a true collaboration between the three of them and they they said they spent um, sometimes three to four hours on Zoom together in a session to decide which pieces were right, how to pair them with artists that were really connected to the landscapes that they were in community with, and they were extremely intentional in that process. And I know there was an anthology kind of like this about uh, Alaska, about an Alaska region that stretches down from, um, Corey, you're nodding. Do you want to talk about that? No, I actually, uh, I was nodding and because I believe there's a Southern Appalachia one too. Aren't you in that, Sean? Yeah, there's a field guide to Southern Appalachia that's just absolutely beautiful that I think maybe was another partial inspiration. Um, I was just curious about all the writings besides the poetry and the art which have the authors and there's a lot of data in the back that is a little overwhelming. So I was curious just about the, the writing part. And who who did it? <laughs> no. Yeah, I wanted to ask that. Oh, okay. no, go ahead. <laughs> Are we talking about the former question or this question? No, go ahead. Okay, for who did the writing? Yeah, so the three editors actually did the writing that prefaced each section as well as the writing in the back, and they just swapped and took turns, and they didn't want to put their names on it because they really wanted to center beings over humans, uh, the more than more than human world. And I was just going to add to the last question in terms of I don't know what the format is like for the art for the other guides that you all have mentioned, but I know that one of the things that was a little bit. Um, maybe contentious along the way in the creation of this guide was their decision to have wildly different styles of art for the beings and not to use just conventional naturalist style art. And they wanted to do that to speak to the many different perspectives, um, indigenous and otherwise, and the more art that looks maybe more urban or more stylized or so on because these beings do not exist. Uh, we, they both wanted to center the beings and show that the beings don't exist without all of these, you know, at this moment, without all of these different human perspectives. So I just, I felt like that was a really powerful aspect of the anthology and they stood by their decision to try to make that incredibly varied and the same with the poems. I mean, you heard, you know, all kinds of different takes. And they encouraged writers and artists to approach it not necessarily as scientific taxonomies, yes. but as related to their own cultures and their own relationship to beings and place and community, because they really wanted to push away from a Western way of approaching a, a field guide into something that felt more connected to you know, the, the being experience. Do you have any questions? I have more of a... So, um, I don't remember your name, but you were talking about snossages. Uh, and I totally remember that commercial and the fact that you tortured your children with it makes me really like you. Um, but, and, and as a rather indoorsy person, I'm Claire's sister and we could not be more opposite when it comes to, she's always like, let's go hike up Mount something. And I'm like, uh, um, so I really like the way that you brought that pocket gopher and kind of related it to us indoorsy folk. Um, okay. And then also brought back that fabulous commercial, which I still find 
hilarious. There is something funny about popping out and saying snossages. I don't... Do you want to watch the video with me afterwards? Because I've Absolutely. been watching it on my phone. <laughs> Absolutely. Let's let's look at it. I'm I'm all for it. I, I'm 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 there. I'm okay, there. Okay. I'm so glad we found each other. I know. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's all I wanted to say. <laughs> Do we have any more questions or snossage commentary? <laughs> Anybody? If we run out, Alexandra and I are happy to pitch a couple of questions too. Um, I, I'm happy to pitch a question. I would really love to know how the work that folks did with this anthology spurred into new or existing projects. Um, and maybe what you're up to now, and or where else we could find you at the festival. You want us all to just go down? Well, just whoever wants. We'll okay. 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 Um, okay. So at 4:15, um, <laughs> Maya and I and Alexandra and two other writers will be reading. I don't know where. There. Okay, so, and it's going to be a great event. It's called Sly Witchy Twisted. I'm getting it wrong. Can you help me? Sly Witchy Twisted. Free. Free. Very important. Sly Witchy Twisted Free. And um, we're all going to read from our um, works, and our, our common theme is um, the experience of being a woman in this culture. So, um, so, um, and so that's coming up. And then what is the other question? What work you might have oh. sparked on? Okay. Um, <laughs> I don't think I have something else that's like the Northern Pocket Gopher. But when I was reading it, I was thinking, oh, I think I do, it kind of like what Keija was saying, and maybe this isn't good. I think I do use like some things as props or launching out points, right? And so listening to all of these, wonder and also reading this book and learning all these things about the natural world that I don't know because of my life inside is making me think about like how I could endeavor to write about that more. <laughs> um. Yeah, I I worked on this piece when I was um, during the pandemic, and when I had the very great fortune to have the Marjorie Davis Boyden Wilderness Writing Residency, which is a really incredibly unique residency program in southwestern Oregon. And I spent seven and a half months living off grid in the woods with no cell service or Wi-Fi, um, and then moved to the to the land of the sage grouse. Um, and when I was there during that residency, worked on a manuscript that I'm kind of wrapping up and starting to look for a home for now, which is called Your Mother's Bear Gun. Um, but I also have two other books of poetry in the world, which I think you can probably find around town in Missoula, though this is my only book festival event. So thanks very much for being here. Um, so a project that has come out of my participation with this book, um, it hasn't developed into a project I'm going to manifest beyond that. I, I've had a very big thought change in my mind. Um, for years, and for, for almost 25, 30 years, I've been keeping field journals for my rambles outdoors. And for many of those years, I've been teaching uh, people of all different ages or just introducing them to this practice of engaging with the landscape through writing and drawing. Um, and when I, I did my undergraduate thesis on it, and at that time, my focus was really on, let's discover the landscape, like let's make discoveries. And, and, I, and I took it as my inspiration, Lewis and Clark, like, you know, they, they were passing through a landscape and um, oftentimes they wouldn't be able to see their subjects ever again, you know, if they didn't take clear and careful notes at that moment. So for me, that was, that was sort of an interesting story to, to uh, have some allegiance with, but as time has gone on, I realized really it's the Natural History Field Journal is a tool for re-inhabitation, you know, for learning to, to re-inhabit a landscape that for so many historical, political, cultural, so many reasons we have become um, separated from. And, we, and so, this, so that's been really an interesting thought change. And I'm, um, I had a chance to teach this week with young people in, in the Blackfoot Valley on a collaborative conservation um, hands-on course. They're here from Minnesota. And, and I realized that as I introduced this tool, for them it was, it, I really introduced it as a tool for re-inhabitation and, and, and also waking our senses up, which are con continually dulled by our fast-paced, overstimulating culture. 
So that's one thing. And I'm here and gone for the book festival, but it, it sounds amazing. Um, so the poem that I read that's in the anthology, uh, I did not write for the anthology, like like Tammy, it's one that I had written um, before, and uh, when the editors asked me um, if I was interested in contributing a poem, they said, do you want to choose from the list or do you have something? And I had many poems about beings in uh, Cascadia, and so I just sent them uh, a bunch of those, and they picked the one that they wanted. Um, and, and my first three books are, are heavily populated by those beings, um, but uh, what I'm working on now is, is not. It's more populated by human beings, and, um, and it's interested in Queerness, sex, shame, reckoning, responsibility, humility, and uh, the past. So, um, so occasionally, like the dog shows up in the poems, but um, but not a lot of elk. Um, yeah, I, I I'm not gonna do anything officially for the book. Fest, fair any or festival um, after this, but I am going to go to the reading you guys are doing, so I'll be there. Um, <laughs> I, um, I, I wrote this for the book. Um, I was in the process of working on a book that I'm, I'm wrapping up right now um, that's titled The Negroes Send Their Love. Um, this poem will be a part of that book um, the books the book looks at um, sort of fatherhood father-son relationships um, home migration sort of moving around um, earlier Kate you said to be an American you need to live all over America I've kind of done that um, from born and raised in Georgia lived in uh, Texas uh, called northern Minnesota home for a decade um, Lived in Alaska for about six years. Um, Calif California, Wisconsin, um, yeah, just kind of around. Um, and so the book tracks some of that traveling. The book is concerned with um, race as a social construct, because why not? Um, and, and, and also the book is concerned with community and all kinds of community and the threats that communities face due to global climate change. Um, and then there's a sci-fi out in space thread um, 400 years into the future. Um, it's, yeah, I just talked to my editor this morning about it. He's like, no, it's looking good. Just keep, it's, it's coming together. So, yeah. But, um, so yeah, this, this poem fits in with that in a lot of ways. Um, well, I'm, I have three books out there, and there's a lot of prairie in them. Um, so, and in the, you know, the manuscript I have now, there, I suppose not so much prairie, but, you know, bats and, and grizzlies and butterflies and flies and all kinds of animals. So, um, I just think it's in my blood, given where I was raised and how, you know, in in the prairie, um, it, it can appear to be barren or dry or dull, but there are gems everywhere. And, and I think when you grow up in that world, your eye uh, focuses there. You pay really careful attention to the surprises and the colors that appear. and. Um, so um, I guess I just continue with that. So I'm a transplant to this area. I have lived in, I think, about as many states as Sean has. Um, yeah, all over. Born in Texas, raised in northwest Arkansas, lived in Missouri, lived in Florida, lived in Hawaii, lived in California, and then moved to Moscow, Idaho 12 years ago. Um, and so I have always written a lot about place, but again, usually kind of less about the details of the natural world in those places, but thinking a lot about kind of geography, and my first book is called Mortal Geography. Uh, but yeah, it took me until poems in my 
uh, previous book and the manuscript that I've got finished now before I started writing more overtly about you know this region and Moscow, Idaho. Um, still fewer poems that kind of gravitate you know, as directly to place it, or to the beings of places as Clark's Nutcracker does. But um, some things that are moving more towards that world and concerns about climate change. The manuscript that I have now is very wrapped up with climate change, as I know many people's work are now. It's hard not to be thinking about that all the time with, you know, smoke season and, you know, just the, the many threats to the environment. Uh, so I'm definitely writing in those directions. And then the book that is sitting out there I met for the first time yesterday. So I've got a memoir in essays out, and they sent the very first copies to Fact and Fiction. So I touched it for the first time last night, um, but that definitely has an essay in it about moving to Idaho and it taking me years to uh, reckon with my country roots of my very country Texas family and admit uh, the ways in which country music and the landscape around there and everything were kind of true to my background that I had sort of tried to shun. Um, so then I got asked to be on an Idaho women writers panel at, at the Western Literature Association conference in about a month. And you know, the person who asked me was like, do you consider yourself to be an Idaho women writer? And I was like, well, I am a woman and I've been living in Idaho for 12 years and I write. So like, yes, I think at this stage, like I don't, you know, I, I'm not from there. So I don't have the deep roots um, that some of the panelists do, but, um, Certainly, um, I am reckoning with the place that I am now. So, yeah. Should we do another? Does anyone have a final question, or shall we wrap things up so people can buy lots of books and have us sign them and just mingle and talk about? Then Laura can play the video of the yeah <laughs> of the snossages, which she played for Maya and me last night and terrified us in the car. To be honest, thank you all so much for being an amazing audience. Um, we look forward to talking to you more. And thank you to all the panelists.